Good evening and welcome to Calvary Chapel of Roswell. I'd like to uh, thank everyone for coming tonight. We have a guest speaker, Pastor Jim is still on vacation and uh, he should be back, uh, God willing, next Tuesday in the office. So we'll praise the Lord for that. Uh, those watching on Facebook or on YouTube, if you have prayer requests, we're going to do the normal Wednesday night service. That if you have any prayer requests, put them in the uh, comments or you can text Gala, and this way we'll be a little bit ahead of the game. So if you would like to rise, and we'll call up the worship team, and we'll begin with praise and worship. Father, we thank you. We praise you, Father, for your love and your mercy and your goodness, Lord. Father, your long sufferings, Father, are, are just ways to show us your love, Lord. We thank you, Father, for your protection over your nation, Lord, the apple of your eye, Israel, Lord. We thank you, Father, for all those missiles that not hit anything or any loss of life. And we just thank you, Father, that you are true to your word, Lord. We ask you, Lord God, for uh, the worship tonight, Lord, that it would help us, Lord God, to leave the calves of the world, Lord, as we come and we learn about you, Lord, that we worship you, Father. We see you high and lifted up, Lord Jesus. And we ask you, Lord God, to meet us here tonight in your sanctuary. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What a friend we have in Jesus All our sins and griefs to bear What a privilege to carry Everything to God in prayer Oh, what peace we often forfeit Oh, what needless pain we Because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord and pray. Are we weak and heavy laden, numbered with a load of care? Precious Savior, still our rest. Forsake thee, take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take and shield thee. Thou will find us all there. In his arms he'll take and shield thee. Thou will find us all there. Robed in white and God is pleased. 
down before you, Lord God. We lift up your name, Lord, for you are the most high God. Your word is eternal, Lord. Your word is uh, our strength, our fortress, our shield, Father. Lord God, now, Lord God, just let the world just melt off of us, Father. Help us to continually focus upon you, Lord. Open up our hearts, our ears, our minds, Father, to your word, Lord. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good evening, and welcome. Oops, and welcome to Calvary Chapel of uh, Roswell. I forgot I had the mic in my hand, so we'll uh, like to welcome you all. And uh, one change, uh, Chuck Smith always used to say, "Blessed are the flexible, for they shall bend and not break." The high school, the branches are going to stay in here. The uh, mid high, led by Amy Bohr, is going to go back to the children's ministry. Okay, so all the high school people kind of stay in here. And if not, Billy will redirect you over to here. So on Wednesday, typically what we have is uh, Rice is going to go through the sanctuary down the middle. If you have prayer requests, just please pass them to the center aisle. Rice and I will pray for them. And not only that, but we would like to have you, the body of Christ, also pray along with us. Have your mind intentionally on the prayer request. Pray silently. You could add to the prayer. You could add into your own silent prayers. But one thing that the Word of God does tell us in uh, Thessalonians is that we should pray without ceasing, especially in the times that we live in, the times that we live in, that the days are truly evil, and we should be constantly about the, the Father's business. So as what's one of the main things that Pastor Jim always uh comes through that our mind should be intentional about praying. Father, we thank you. We praise you, Father, for this time, Lord, to just come before your throne room, Lord. We thank you, Father, for the privilege of prayer. 
We thank you, Lord God, that we would come with our our needs, our wants, our desires. Father, we pray, Lord God, that it would be according to your word, Lord. We thank you, Father, for this time, Lord. We pray, Father, that through prayer, Lord God, that we can reach our Jerusalem, Judea, and into the outermost parts of the world here in the in the city of Roswell, Lord. We thank you, Father, for that, Lord, and we ask you that we would pray according to your will, Lord. Heavenly Father, we lift up our brother Jeff Caps, and we join him in his prayer for his mom, Charlotte for her safety at home alone, Lord. We pray that you would guide her and protect her as she's there, Lord. We also pray for your sister Jan as she uh, is taking care of uh, their mom. Father, we pray for patience. Father, give her patience and comfort her during that time as she takes care of her mom, Lord, and Jeff's mom. Father, we pray for uh, his niece-in-law, niece-in-law Nicole, for recovery from cancer surgery, Lord. Father, we pray for liberty coding, for safety for tra- during travel and at work, Lord. Father, just be with, um, be with Jeff as he uh, continues uh, to have an opportunity to share the truth of your gospel with others, Lord. Father, we lift up this unnamed prayer request, Lord. We pray, Father, for the nation of Israel, Lord. Father, your nation, your people, are the apple of your eye, Lord. We ask you, Father, for her protection, her guidance, her wisdom, Lord. We also pray, Father, for the marriages of our flock, Lord, and for the Christian marriages, Father, throughout the the city of Roswell and Travis County, Father. We pray, Father, that truly Christian marriages, Father, would be examples, Lord God, to the marriages in the world, Lord. That, Father, that there would be a, a distinctive between the two marriages, Lord, that, that the husband, Father, would love the li- wife, Lord, even as Christ loved, loved the church, Lord, and died, Father, for it. We pray, Father, for the comfort of Wayne Clark, Lord, who is battling, battling stage four cancer, Lord. I pray, Father, your word says that you are the God of all comfort. And I pray, Father, that you would comfort him, Lord, that you would ease his pain, Lord. He knows you, Father, and I just pray, Lord God, for the salvation of his family, Lord. I pray that you would just touch him, Lord. We pray, Father, for your word to revive our lives, Lord, so that we could be witnesses, Lord that we could be that sweet-smelling aroma, those ambassadors of Christ Jesus in our families, in our city, in our state, our nation, and throughout the world, Lord. Father God, we lift up our sister Dita, and we join her in prayer uh, as we pray for our church members who have been sick, Lord, and those who have had surgeries. Father, we pray for your rescue, for your healing, Lord. Father, that there would be a quick and complete recovery, Lord. We may that you, uh, pray that you strengthen them each day and that they would uh, understand and know that you're a God who loves them and cares for them and comforts them, Lord. Father, we pray for all who are lost. Uh, Father, we pray that their hearts would be softened. Father, that you would do that work that only you could do. Lord, by your mercy, would you cause them to believe, Lord, and that their life would be radically changed. Father, I pray along with uh, Frank, Lord, his consistent prayer father for his two sons jason and stephen lord i pray father lord god that you would just save jason and save stephen lord that father that you would bring back the scriptures lord god that frank has been sharing with them lord god through through their lives lord i pray father that your word is alive and sharper than a two-edged sword father that you would pierce their hearts lord with your love your mercy and your grace i also pray father for frank's uh, upcoming trip uh to uganda lord I pray, Father, that you would just work out all the details, Lord, that you just work out every single one, that you would start laying, Lord God, the, the foundation for that trip, Lord Jesus. Father, we lift up Nathan as he continues to ask for his walk with you, Lord. We pray, Father, that you would strengthen him, Lord, that you would guide him. Father, we know that we are weak and that you your strength is perfected in our weakness, Lord. So, Father, just be with Nathan and lift him up and strengthen him. Father, we uh, additionally, we pray for his family, Lord, that uh, they would all grow with you, Lord. Father, it is a, a beautiful thing to, to see a family that loves you and wants to walk with you, Lord. Father, I lift up this prayer request with Chris Coker, Lord. We just pray, Father, for Eric Stangby's recovery, Lord, from surgery, Lord. I pray, Father, that you would, you're the maker, Lord. You're the great physician, Lord. I pray, Father, that you would just touch him lord that you would just heal him the parts that were operated on lord 
Father, Lord God, that you would be with his wife, be with his, their children, Lord God. Protect them, Father. Lord God, just bring them back safely, le- safely, Lord, and just minister to this family. Hold them in your hands, Lord, that you are the God of all comfort, that you would comfort this family at this time. Father God, we lift, in, we lift Colin right now, Lord, and Father, we pray uh, with him as he asks you for his walk uh, with you, Lord, that uh, he would turn away from addiction, Lord, and that you would work in his life, Lord, a real work, a, a true work. And, Lord, we know that you are the only one that changes us, and those changes are real uh, from the inside out, Lord. So, Father, we just agree and stand with Colin. We pray that you would, would strengthen him, Lord, in his weakness. Father, that you would that you would deliver him as only you can, Lord, and we give you glory. Father, we lift up this prayer request by Sally Ann Stangby, Lord. She's just praising you, Lord God, for your your hand over the surgeon, all of the staff there, Lord, at the uh, operating room and, and throughout the hospital, Lord. We thank you, Father, that you've touched uh, Eric in such a way, Lord. We pray, Father, for strength for Sally's mom. And Eric, Lord, that the surgery would just continually heal. And Father, Lord God, we also pray, Lord, for continual healing, Lord. Father, you are a good, good God, Lord. And Father, Lord God, we love you. We praise you, Father. And it's just amazing to see you at work, Lord. Father God, we uh, join Kevin and Kathy in their uh, fervent and consistent prayer, Lord, for uh, the salvation of their family, Lord, for their children to return to you, Lord. Father, we pray for the salvation and comfort uh, for the Myers families, for the loss of, of Kelsey's mom and kids and grandmother. Lord, we pray for them. We pray for our leaders and for you to give them wisdom, Lord. Father, we lift up Terry Williams' prayer request, Lord, for Jeannie Boer's friends uh, and sister, Jane, Lord. She has uh, two strokes in two weeks, Lord. Father, that... It could have happened at any other time, Lord. And we just ask you, Lord God, that your Holy Spirit would minister to her. Father, that you would heal her, Lord. Father, Lord God, that you would just shed your love and your mercy upon this family, Lord. Heavenly Father, we join our sister Peggy Samuels, Lord. And we pray for her grandsons, Lord. Father, you know. And Father, I just pray that you would hold them and draw them near, Lord. Father, you know what they need. You know where they are. Father, draw them to yourself, Lord. Uh, transform them uh, as they need, uh, as whatever needs to happen in their lives to, to walk with you, Lord. Father, we pray for the marriages in our flock. Father, marriage in this society is not revered. It's not honored. Uh, but, Father, in your church it is because you ordained marriage. Father, help us to stand upon your biblical uh, precepts and statutes in marriage, Lord, that we would be husbands and wives that stand upon your word, Lord. Father, we pray for all the families uh, on our prayer chain, Lord, There's of which there's many, Lord, but we know that you're a mighty God, Lord, and we thank you that you hear our prayers, Lord, and we thank you that you answer. Father, we lift up Jeannie's prayer request, Lord. Her prayer request is for her daughter, Gina, Lord, for complete recovery from the surgery that she had a while back, Lord. Jeannie is also lifting up the marriages, Father, and for the sick, the elderly, for, for our kids, Lord, that have walked away from you, Lord. We pray, Father, Lord God, that you would draw the prodigals back, Lord. And, Father, for our nation, Lord God, Lord God, that you would uh, give the, our leaders wisdom. We also pray, Father, for the nation of Israel and for, up, for our up-and-coming elections, Lord. We pray, Father, for that, Lord, that... The, the nations deserve the leaders that you put in place, Lord. And we pray, Father, for godly leaders and godly wisdom in that, Lord. For the loss of, uh, for our ministers, ministries here, Lord, at the church, Father, Lord God, that you would strengthen them, Lord, that you would allow people to step out of their comfort zone, Lord. And Father, just take that first step, Lord, even as, as you guided Abraham, Lord. You told Abraham to get up and to walk, Lord. And, Father, you directed him. He did not get lost in the desert, Lord. You directed his path, Lord, that take the apprehension away from those people, Lord, just wanting to serve but not knowing how to, Lord. 
And Father, Lord God, just for our lost family members to come to the knowledge of saving grace of your son, Jesus. Father God, we join in prayer and praise with Clinton and Gayla, Lord, as they praise uh, for Clinton's niece who had a biopsy and the re results were benign. So, Lord, we give you thanks for that, Lord. But, Father, we also bring before you R.B. and Lori Simmons. Lori has uh, cancer and is now in hospice and uh, quite possibly may go home soon, Lord. Uh, and we just pray, Father, for peace and for comfort for the family, Lord. Father, thank you. Because as we go through trials and tribulations, Lord, you're always there. You're a God that is always working things for good, Lord. Father, we thank you uh, that the battle belongs to you. Father, this prayer request is from Gina Brooks, Lord. Today, Lord, is eight weeks, Father, since the emergency surgery. And Father, Gina just wants to thank you and praise you, Father, for the wisdom of getting her to the hospital. For the surgeons, Lord, that prepared and, and did that operation, Lord, and just for the healing process, Father. And she just wants to thank, Father, the family of God that came alongside of her family, Lord, and lifted them up into prayer and just be the family of God that you have taught us how to be, Lord God. And, Lord God, we just pray, Lord God, for their son, Christopher, and his return to the Lord Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, I, I just lift up one of my uh, friends and co-workers uh, in the school just, just district, Lord, who's been diagnosed with uh, stage 4 cancer, Lord. Father, I just want to lift her up to you, Lord, and I pray that you would touch her body. Father, that you would heal her. Father, that you would uh, put uh, wise uh, physicians around her who will make good decisions and, and give uh, good help but father we know that you are the great healer we know that our trust can only truly be in you lord so father i pray for comfort and for peace i know that she knows you i pray that you would draw her near to you lord that you would bless her even during this time of of grief and trauma that i'm sure she's having to deal with lord but it, we thank you because you're a god of comfort you're a God who is full of grace and full of loving kindness. So, Father, lift her up and lift her family up, Lord. And we pray for your mighty hand upon this situation, Lord. Father, we lift up our sister Mary McClure to you, Lord. Our friend Ellen, who has received, just received two units of blood, Lord. She had a bone marrow done yesterday. Father, through this bone marrow something went amiss lord that she's bleeding from somewhere and she doesn't know where the doctors have no clue lord but you do father lord god they're still waiting on the bone marrow test uh, results to come back lord we pray father that lord god you've created the, the circulatory system lord you you just coagulate that blood lord father that you would just stop it father lord god we just ask for god that mary would just bring comfort and wisdom to her friend ellen lord we pray, Father, that you would just minister to, to her in this area, Lord. I lift up John and, and Abby to you, Lord, as John had uh, heart problems yesterday in the cath lab, Lord. We just lift them up before you, Lord, and we ask, Father, that you would touch him, that you would comfort him, Father. Lord God, we bring all these prayer requests, Father, before you, Lord. <coughs> we thank you, Lord God, that you've given us the opportunity, Lord, to pour out our hearts before your throne room, Lord. We pray, Lord God, that it was according to your will. Father, the song that we just sung, Lord, earlier in the service, Lord, what needless pain that we bear because we don't take everything to you in prayer, Lord. We pray, Father, Lord God, that you would put a spirit of, of prayer upon our hearts, that you would put a, a spirit of worship, Father, throughout the day, Lord God, that we would be different, Lord, that we would bring that hope of your son Jesus Christ to this world, Lord, this world has no hope, Lord. Our hope is in Jesus Christ, Lord. Help us to be that salt. Help us to be that light, Lord God. We thank you. We worship you. We praise you, Father, for you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And we all said amen. Well, tonight we'd like to, uh, Pastor Jim has been, uh, if you hadn't noticed, when he's been on vacation, there's been a, uh, he's been going through, especially on Wednesday night, a series of bringing 
missionaries, or not missionaries, but ministries that are the local church has been supporting throughout the years. We had the, the uh, Crisis Pregnancy Center, and we've had other uh, ministries that we have supported. And tonight, I'd like to welcome uh, Pastor Mark Green. He's from uh, Harvest Ministry, and the church has support, been supporting Harvest Ministries for quite some time now. So, Pastor Mark, if you would like to come up. Well, thank you very much. It's a joy for me to be here this first time. I've had the opportunity to come and uh, speak here. I'm glad to be here. And um, I've known a lot of the folks in this church for some time. As a matter of fact, the more I hear the names of people who attend Calvary Chapel, it's kind of like a who's who of um, some of the best people in Roswell. So it really is a joy for me to be here with you and uh, also to have... How many of you have ever volunteered at Harvest? Anybody? We've got a few. Of course, we've got Bob here. Bob's one of our faithful. Bob Mervakis and uh, our local evangelist. Glad to have Bob with us. And we also know, I want to ask how many of you support Harvest because that, your church is one of the um, top three supporters of Harvest Ministries in the city. I don't know if you knew that or not, but you are. And uh, we really, really, really appreciate it. Pr appreciate Pastor Jim. And to be honest with you, I'm a little bit intimidated to be up here in his pulpit because I know he's such an excellent teacher. And, um, but I'm going to share with you a little bit. First of all, I'm going to share with you about Harvest. And um, how many of you know what Harvest Ministries is? Almost everybody? So Harvest Ministries is the local food bank for Chavis County. And we're also a ministry outreach center and uh, a homeless service center. And we uh, are also function as a food bank to 14 other agencies here in Chavez County. So uh, we receive food and donations. We also pick up food um, that is, um, for whatever reason, is not marketable. It's not sellable from Walmart, Sam's, uh, Target, Albertsons, Farmers, uh, some of the uh, other local agricultural agencies here in the community. So uh, we pick up all of that food and we call it food rescue. So you rescue the food that would otherwise possibly be thrown out. And then we redistribute it um, to people in the community who need it, or we also share it with 14 other agencies here in Chavis County. So um, Harvest Ministry started back in 2001. Pastor Ruby Rubenstein. Anybody, of, any of you guys know Pastor Ruby? Oh, there's more hands going up. Pastor Ruby was kind of an icon. He, he was hard to miss here in Roswell. And uh, if you saw Pastor Ruby coming your direction, you either loved it or you were afraid. What is Ruby going to do? What is he going to say? But he was such, such a, he had such a heart, you know, such a passion. And Ruby and I had been friends for a long time. And um, so he, when he got ready to retire, he made a beeline for me one time. We were at Christ Church at a night to honor Israel. And um, I saw him from across the sanctuary and uh, our eyes met and he started heading my way and I said oh he's he's coming here he's got something to say we had been friends for a long time and uh, he came over and he said I'm about to retire from Harvest Ministries and I believe you're the man to take my place <laughs> and so we started talking about it and we uh, we prayed about it I prayed for a month and uh, that's okay I believe that that's what God has a uh, little bit of my history uh, I was very blessed and fortunate to be raised in a Christian home in a very very Bible believing church and and we just uh, were drilled in the, in the Word of God all of my life growing up in Sunday school and kids' church and Bible quiz and all sorts of things. And I lived just, uh, or our church was rather just a couple of blocks from uh, Southwestern Assemblies of God Bible College. So a lot of the people in our church were actually former teachers or teachers, and they were a lot of my Sunday school teachers. So I kind of had the cream of the crop teaching me growing up. And uh, so I, had, I was just very, very blessed to have that kind of an upbringing and God called me into the ministry when I was 13 years old I mean I very very definitely knew at that from that time on I was going to be in the ministry but you know when you're a young person you're not really sure what you're going to do or where you're going to go and uh, so I thought well I can be a minister and a rancher I can be a minister and a veterinarian I can be a minister and an architect so I wasn't sure how that was going to play out but when I was 15 I went on my first missions trip and God called me to the mission field and so I spent uh, several years on the mission field, uh, some in, in Mexico first, 
then in Africa, in Costa Rica, uh, did some short-term work in Nicaragua and Bolivia, in Israel, and uh, several years in Africa. And so uh, God just really, really blessed me in that ministry, called me at a young age, and I got to fulfill that. And so um, we, you know, the, the time, time comes when there's a change in your life. And uh, my wife, Levon, and I were pastoring here, and, and um, here in Roswell, we've moved here uh, to work in a, a, a kind of a teen challenge ministry that didn't quite take off, and so then God opened the door for us to pastor, and we pastored for several years here. But there was a time when, and by the way, I'm always happy to have my wife with me. She's always my better half. And, uh, you know, they say behind every successful rancher, there's a wife who has a job in town. Well, <laughs> behind every itinerant ministry missionary, there's a wife who has a real job. <laughs> and uh, not that that's not a real job, but she's, she's running the uh, offices for the farm that uh, we, we love on my family's farm. And so uh, it's always a joy to have her with me. And, uh, I kind of force her to come with me. But anyway, we were, we were pastoring, and, and at the time, I just felt God moving me. I felt him changing directions, and I didn't know where, I didn't know what. I was in the church by myself, and I was just praying and saying, God, I, I really don't know what you want me to do right now. I, I just feel a shift. I'm just, there's an uneasiness in me, and I don't know what to do. And God said, well, why don't you just sing that to me? And you know, and that, I just really felt him say that. Why don't you just sing that to me? And so I thought, Okay, so I went and sat down at the piano. I'm not a great piano player, but I sat down at the piano and just started playing a tune, and then I just started singing that to, to God. And I said, God, sometimes life is so confusing, and I don't know what you're doing, and I'm not sure how you want to use me, but deep in my heart, I hear your spirit calling. And I know in my heart that you are calling me, so there's a word in Hebrew that is throughout the Scripture, and we see it several times, Abraham, Isaac, Jesus, and others, and that, that Hebrew word is hineni. Say that with me, hineni. Hineni means here am I. Here am I. So in that song, I just say, here am I. Send me, Lord, I'm willing. Here am I. And whatever you want me to do, if it's just to give a cup of cold water to a thirsting man or to share the bread of heaven in a barren land, here am I. And so I wrote that song. And from time to time, I'd still sing it. Didn't know what God had for me, but it was shortly after that the Pastor Ruby approached me and said, uh, I believe you're the man to take my place here at Harvest Ministries. And so, you know, having gone all these different places in the world, but here and now at Harvest, I get to do exactly what God showed me in that song that he gave me, and that is to give food to people who are hungry and to give them, obviously, what I'm wanting to give them is the Word of God. And so God has just opened the doors for us to do that. So at Harvest Ministries, um, last year in 2023, we distributed 751,000 pounds of food to our clients and to 14 other agencies. 22% of the people that we serve uh, were children last year, under 18. 24% were seniors and the balance in between that. So unduplicated here in Chavis County, we served 5,812 people just through Harvest Ministries, not counting the other 14 agencies and the people who were served through those agencies. So just through Harvest Ministries, uh, that's over basically 10% of our population that were served through Harvest. Uh, total households served, everyone, everyone in the household served as many times as they came back undu and duplicated, was 23,000, so 23,416 people. And, and homeless visits, and of course you've seen homelessness has increased here in the city a lot on every corner uh, through Main Street up and down 2nd and Main. And um, so we had 8,394 homeless visits to, to Harvest. And we served 13,030 breakfasts to the homeless uh, last year. So that's what we're doing. Of course, our goal always is to show them the love of God. For many of our people, it's a long-term process. It's not a, a one-time thing because uh, a lot of the people that come to us, in particular the homeless, uh, have drug problems, alcohol problems, mental health issues, emotional problems. And it's not just a come to the altar, give your heart to Jesus, get up and go on and your life is fine. And one of the things that you can pray with us about also is uh, we're trying to hit that balance. We, we started last year in uh, March of last year what we call home church. 
And so we have a service for the homeless at 8.30 on Sunday morning, and our volunteers come, and we cook a hot breakfast for them. And uh, on Resurrection Sunday, we serve them uh, steak and eggs. So they got T-bone steaks and ribeyes and eggs and, and biscuits and gravy. I mean, they had a great meal. So uh, we like to do that, and then we're leading them to the Lord. Almost everybody that's come in at, at one of our services has prayed the, the prayer, the sinner's prayer with us. Uh, But then my question is, now what do I do with these people? Now they're brothers and sisters in the Lord, and I'm still sending them back out onto the streets. So what do we do? In 2016, uh, myself, Pastor Sean Wigley, who's from Gateway, is always also uh, a volunteer and uh, one of our pastors at Harvest Ministries. And he and I and some other people got together and started calling for a a homeless coalition here in Roswell. So in 2016, we started the Roswell Homeless Coalition that operated out of Harvest for the first year and now it's it is its own entity and the Roswell Homeless Coalition has been very very blessed in the last two years uh, over 120 people have been cycled off the streets into jobs into homes or back with their families uh, come to know the Lord so uh, great work there happening through um, the Roswell Homeless Coalition as well so in James chapter 1 it says this Pure and undefiled religion for, before our God and Father is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained from the world. In chapter uh, 2, verse 14, he says, If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warm and well fed, but you do not give them what the body needs, what good is that? So also faith, if it does not have works, is dead by itself. But some will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. So James is saying here, Jacob actually his name, is saying uh, real service to God, real religious service is that we would minister to the orphans and and the widows in their distress and to keep oneself unspotted from the world, and then to give to the brother or sister who is naked and lacks daily food. that the things that they need that's really putting our faith in action and so that's that's what we want to do at harvest ministries and we can only do that <clears throat> because of the support of people like you people like uh, your your church your congregation supporters and the volunteers who come to harvest and and help us do it so the majority of our work is done through volunteers uh, last year we had over 13,000 volunteer hours So we have a volunteer group of about 45 who come in. Some come every day. We have people that have been there for 20 years. We have a couple of people who have been there every day, almost every day, for the last 10 years. And so we have just an amazing group of volunteers, but we can always use more. So if you would like to come volunteer any any day, Monday through Thursday, between 8 and 12, uh, you can come on out and we'll find a place for you. There's always lots to do and uh, we can always do more. So we would invite you to come out and, and uh, join us as volunteers. And uh, we love what we're doing because the people come to us because food is a very basic need, right? A basic need for life. But for us, that's ground zero. We're, we're at the very, I mean, if they don't have food, you may not have electricity or, or you may not have water, you may not have a house. But if you don't have food or water, you're in trouble. And so we really are ground zero for people who are in need in our community or coming to us, and in particular the homeless. But <clears throat> we want to use that opportunity not just to feed people. Obviously, we, want, we don't want anybody to go hungry. And that's the majority of our work. <clears throat> but the heart of our work, as you would know, the heart of our work is for them to know Jesus. That is Their need for, for food is the springboard for us to be able to share the gospel with them. To be able to love them, and as I said, for many of them, that's a long-term process. You love them every day, and uh, there are a few of them that we have to kick out, and we have to ban and say, you can't come back for a month or so because of something they do or some way they, they act. We say, sorry, you can't come back, uh, but we always forgive them. We always bring them back because it's a long-term process of showing them the love of God and helping them get off the streets, helping them get what they need. So I want to share with you for a few minutes uh, this evening. My wife told me not to be long-winded because you've just eaten a meal, and you may be like, you know, ready to take a nap. So uh, I'll try not to be too long-winded, but I do want to share with you um, about, I'm going to talk to you about food. So food, sustenance, everything living has to eat food. We all have to eat. And we can only eat, have you ever thought about this? You can only eat something that's living. 
You can only eat something that's alive or has been alive. You can't eat anything that's dead. You don't get anything out of it. Except for minerals, salt, things like that. But the bulk of your, of your diet has to be something that was living. In other words, you take the life of whatever you're going to eat and you can, by that life, by the death of whatever you're eating, whether it's a plant or an animal, the life of that animal gives you life, gives you sustenance. Have you ever thought about that? You can only eat living things and get sustenance out of it. And that's how, in the beginning, it appears that mankind was strictly vegetarian. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 29 through 30, God said, Look, I've given you all of these things. I've given you every green thing. I've given you um, the, the trees bearing seed and the fruit bearing seed. All of these things, God said, will be yours for food. So from the very beginning, God's saying, I'm giving you all of these things for food. They are for food, every living thing. So from the beginning, it seems that man was vegetarian, Adam and Eve, and and possibly all the way, it seems, all the way up to the time of the flood, because God says, I'm giving you all the plants. I'm giving you every green thing. I'm giving you the fruits and the vegetables and all of this for your food. The first commandment, as a matter of fact, if we look at, at food in the in the garden, the very first commandment with a prohibition was what? And he said the first commandment was be fruitful and multiply. And I heard one lady say, brother, that's the only commandment we've ever fulfilled completely is fruit, being fruitful and multiply. But there was a commandment with prohibition, a prohibited thing. What was that? Question and answer time. What was the prohibition? There you go. Don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. All of this, God said, is yours. You can eat all of this. It's all yours. Except one thing. One thing. You shall not eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, for in the day that you eat, you shall die. And and so that when they ate of the fruit of the tree, did they die? Yes. Spiritually, they died. And they began to die physically because of spiritual death, because of the fall. So they didn't die physically. God in His mercy allowed them. He provided a way. They didn't die physically, but they began to die physically because they were spiritually fallen, because of spiritual death. So the first commandment was with with prohibition, not to eat the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And then, of course, God kicks them out of the garden so they don't eat of the tree of life. So both naturally and spiritually, the Bible tells us there are things that we are to feed on and things that we are not to feed on. And it was only after the fall do we see the first death of anything, of both animals and man. Apparently, it was God who killed the first animal. It wasn't man that killed, that made the first death. Man brought death by his sin, but God, for, God killed the first animal. Why did God kill the first animal? To clothe Adam and Eve in their, in their nakedness because after they had sinned, they realized they were naked, they were vulnerable, they, shame came on them. And so they made themselves, the Bible says, they made themselves loincloths or girdles or it really just says a belt, it's translated in some places, uh, out of fig leaves, out of something that's natural. Man's natural attempt to cover his shame, to cover for his sin. But God said, no, that's not good enough. And so God killed an animal. We only know that because God made their clothes out of skin, out of, out of hide, out of animal hide. So in order, God makes the first sacrifice. He sacrifices an animal to cover the sins of man. And he didn't make them a loincloth. God made them ketunot, it is in the Hebrew, which where, where we get the word tunic. He made them tunics. He made them robes. Out of, um, out of skins. And so, note that man tries to cover. He tries to make atonement. That word atonement is the word to cover. Um, the day of atonement is called... Anybody know what day of atonement is in Hebrew? Yom Kippur. Yeah, good, thank you. Yom Kippur. So that word Kippur is the word for cover. And uh, it's the, the covering over the Ark of the Covenant was the caparet, the, uh, the mercy seat, the covering for the Ark. Um, The little caps that Jewish men put on their heads are called kippahs, and uh, that's where we get our word cap. So there you have some Hebrew English. We get our word cap from this ancient word kippur. And so man tries to cover his own sin, but he can't do it. It's not, it won't work. We see the same principle with Cain and Abel, right? Where Cain uh, is going to offer God some of the fruit of the ground, vegetables, fruits, whatever, Abel is going to offer God not only 
Is he going to offer a blood sacrifice? But the first fruits. He's going to offer God the first and the best. But it's also going to be a blood sacrifice. And God's going to receive Abel's offering, but he's going to reject Cain's offering. And then tells Cain, Cain, do what's right. It'll be okay with you. But Cain, in his jealousy, of course, he's going to shed the blood of his brother Abel. And God's going to say, where is your brother? He's going to say, Where's my, I'm not my brother's keeper. Or am I my brother's keeper? And God's going to say, the blood of your brother cries out from the ground. And that word blood in the Hebrew is damim, dame, which means the bloods. Not just blood. That's, you know, blood is, is a non-count noun. Or, you know, you, know, you don't say two, two or three bloods. But in the Hebrew, there's an irregularity there. And he says, the bloods of your brother cry out from the ground. What's he talking about? He's talking about... All of Abel's descendants who would have been born are crying out, we didn't get to be born because um, Cain killed our father. Uh, we would see the same thing of the blood of the innocent through abortion that are crying out uh, in our land, innocent blood being shed. But part of the curse had to do with food as well. Because God told Adam, he said, now that you've done this, before I gave you everything to eat, all you wanted here in the paradise in the garden, you could, you, perfect, the perfect diet for you, perfect blend of everything you needed. He said, but now, part of the curse was, he said, by the sweat of your brow shall you eat bread from the earth. So now man's going to have to work hard. He's going to have to struggle to to. to grow crops that are going to produce he said and now it's going to produce weeds and you're going to have to work hard to produce anything that you can eat i heard that the that at one point cain and abel asked dad tell us again what happened in the garden of eden he said son your mom ate us out of house and home so that's sad right but by the sweat of your brow you're going to eat your bread um and although it seems man did not eat meat until after the flood, he did offer blood sacrifices, we see that with Abel, of clean animals to atone for sin. Now, sometimes people would say, well, the clean and unclean animals only came with the Mosaic Law. That's not true. Obviously, we see that all the way in Genesis. We see it also at the time of Noah. So how many of each kind of animal did Noah take on the ark? Two, right? A pair of each. And also... Thank you, good. Seven of what? Seven pairs of the clean animals. For what? For sacrifice. So of the unclean animals, you know, of all the pictures, paintings you've ever seen of Noah and the ark, have you ever seen two, 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 seven, seven, seven? Have you ever seen that? People kind of miss that. But there are two pairs, or, or one pair, a uh, male and female, of every unclean animal, and seven pairs of every clean animal because they're going to need those animals for sacrifice. And after the ark lands and the dry land comes out, they sacrifice that pair. And oops, well, but we just ended that one, right? So no, God says seven pairs of all of the clean animals. So there was clean animals all the way back before the flood and things that they could eat. Um, during the time of Noah, the Bible says the earth was filled with Hamas. Where have we heard that word before? <laughs> Hamas is the Hebrew word for violence, violence with bloodshed, Genesis 6, 6 12. After the flood, though, because of apparently, <coughs> excuse me, the atmospheric changes, and now uh, the, the sun's rays are going to shine through, there's going to be a rainbow for the very first time. Before that, they had never seen a rainbow, now the sun's rays are shining through, perhaps the canopy of water is, is collapsed as it fell to the earth, and now for the first time a rainbow is seen, and God said, this is not sign of my covenant with you. But he says, now... Uh, no, he says, now I am giving you every living thing that walks or moves on the earth. They shall also be for you for food as every green thing that I gave you before. So God, after the flood, God gave man the ability to eat or the right before that. The man did not have that right. God didn't give him permission to. But after the flood, God gave man permission to eat meat. The only thing was he said, you cannot eat the blood of that animal because he said the life of that animal is in its blood and that animal belongs to me so you cannot eat the blood of that animal so everything we eat whether it's plant or animal has been living it has had a life and we consume the life that is in those animals in order that we may have life in other words something has to die for us to have life 
Even if it's a plant, a vegetable, grass, something, something has to die in order for us to live. And for those of us who are meat eaters, uh, some animal has to die for us to live. We've raised goats, and somebody said, well, do you eat them? We, I, I've never killed anything. Uh, we got chickens. Do you eat your chickens? No, I can't bring myself to eat a chicken. I'll buy a chicken, but I won't kill one of my chickens. But we have, you know, we get eggs from our chickens. But no, I, I can't bring myself. I'll let somebody else do that. Somebody said, you know, if we had to kill our own meat, we would probably eat a lot less meat. But God gave us the right to do that. But everything we eat has to have been living. We take the life of that animal so that we can live, so that we can have life. In the wilderness, the children of Israel were in the wilderness for 40 years. God gave the children of Israel manna to eat for 40 years. It was called the bread of angels. And it sustained them supernaturally with everything they needed for nutrition. So you've got possibly upwards of 3 million people going through the wilderness, kind of like the Badlands of New Mexico between here and El Paso or something. Imagine sustaining 3 million people in that wilderness. Where are they going to get the food? God gives them manna. It falls for 40 years from the second month they were there until they cross into Canaan 40 years later. As soon as they ate the fruits of Canaan, the manna stopped. But for 40 years, God gives them manna and they eat on that manna and it sustains them. It gives them everything that they need. They didn't need fruits and vegetables and meat and everything else. They were healthy. They were strong because the manna that God gave them, the bread that came from heaven, sustained them naturally. I mean, they those, you know, they gathered it and went out and gathered every day, except what day? What day did they not gather? The Sabbath, Saturday. So it really is supernatural, right? It knows to fall six days a week and not fall on the seventh. So it's supernatural, falls from the sky, falls from heaven, six days a week, enough for everyone to have an omer, every person in their family. And so they gather it all up, and it's also supernatural because if they try to keep it over to the next day, what happens? It spoils, except on what day? Saturday. So Friday Friday it gives them twice as much. They gather it, and and they keep it over until Saturday, and it doesn't spoil. So it's truly supernatural bread. It's not operating according to the bread of this earth or, or natural means. It is supernatural, and it's supernaturally sustaining them for 40 years. So it was not just natural bread. But in Exodus 16, 15, it says, Moses said, This is the bread that Yahweh has given you for food. It's the bread. It, it was a bread from, from heaven, the bread of heaven, the, the, the bread of angels. I can tell you after having, this is my 11th year working at Harvest Ministries, that a lot of the food that I come, see come through there. Now, we get, we get a lot of produce, thankfully. We get a lot of frozen meats and things like that. But a lot of the food that comes through there, I can tell you by looking at the food that comes through there, that our American diet consists of a lot of overly processed Overly cooked, altered, modified, preserved, overly sweetened, overly salted, and a lot of just really lifeless food. How many of you agree with me on that? How many of you try to eat healthy at least part of the time? How many of you try to eat healthy most of the time? How many of you don't ever eat healthy? Then you don't have to raise your hands. <laughs> there's, a, there's a few honest souls here that just don't. No, nah, I just really don't do that. Um, so Levon and I, we probably 2009, so almost 15 years ago, we began to eat biblical kosher. And that's not anything that I push on anybody else, but we, not, not glatt kosher, the extreme, but, but just biblical kosher, what God said that they could eat and couldn't eat. And that's just our choice. That's our, that's our discipleship uh, that we believe God's called us to do. And so we were used to reading labels anyway. Um, so we read labels to see if what we can eat, you know, if, if we can eat what what we're buying there. For example, we like, you know, if we buy beef sausage, we have to look first. Why do we look at it? All beef wrapped in pork casings. Well, we can't eat that. Uh, For us, that's just our discipleship. That's our choice. And so we're used to reading labels to see what's in it. And it's amazing that you pick something up and the list of ingredients is that long. It's like, I don't even know what all this stuff is. What am I putting in my body? I I don't know, you know. And so we really try to, try to, we try to eat healthy I'll just be honest with you. This week, we've already had McDonald's once and pizza once. So, you know, we're, 
we're not there yet, but we're, you know, we're, we really do try to eat well, and we kind of have this rule of the 80-20. So most of the, we try 80% of the time, we try to eat really healthy. We try to include our vegetables, eat salads, um, eat healthy foods. The other 20% of the time, if we're at a party and there's cake and ice cream, hey, we're going to get cake and ice cream. So that's kind of been our rule for a long time, but the older you get, the less you can get away with. I don't know if y'all know that, but the older you get, the less of that kind of stuff you can get away with. So I, I, I'm not telling you that we always try to do that. But, uh, you know, we're, we're, you know, the Scripture says that your life is not your. You were bought with a price. And, so, and it says your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So really, you and I are stewards of our bodies, right? And part of being a steward of that body is taking care of it. And part of taking care of it, care of it is, is healthy eating. Now, God gave the children of Israel dietary laws. And he says, if you do all these things I'm commanding you, I'll put none of the sicknesses, diseases on you that, I'm putting on the, that I've put on the people around you because they do all of these things. And so uh, that for, for the children of Israel, God was separating. He was sanctifying. He was separating from everybody else. And their dietary law was part of it. The dress was part of it. And, and of course, their religious practices. That was all part of God separating, sanctifying separating them from the nations around them, including uh, observing the Sabbath to separate them from the others around them. But also, I believe it was part of them being healthy uh, because of the things that they would eat in that day. And God also gave them laws about how they were to cook. And, and, and if they got an insect, if they got a rat in their pot or in their food or something, they couldn't just throw it out. They had to throw the whole thing out. Uh, sometimes they had to break the pot it was in. I mean, God was very strict about none of their food being contaminated because God wanted his people to be healthy and set apart and to be a light and for everybody to look at him and say, what other people is like this people who has a God that's so wonderful, who's so close to him? So God was setting them apart. Well, you and I are, are we're temples of the Holy Spirit. We're stewards. And so God, I believe, wants part of that is us taking care of this, this body. But if we take this, of course, and what we want to do tonight as I close here, take this into the spiritual realm. Spiritual food. So everything that the children of Israel could offer to God in sacrifice, they could eat. If they couldn't offer it to God, they couldn't eat it. All the animals that they could offer to God, they had to be the animals that uh, chewed a cud and um, had a split hoof. They couldn't eat anything that had paws or anything that had a split hoof but not chew, didn't chew the cud, like the camel or the, or the pig. They couldn't eat those. So anything that they could offer to God as a sacrifice, they could, they could eat. And that included their fruits and vegetables and grains and things that they would bring and the first fruits offerings and all of those. They could eat all of that, but if they couldn't offer it to God, they couldn't eat it themselves either because they were to be holy unto the Lord. And, and God was separating. He was sanctifying them. So there, you see here that there was both a natural and a spiritual law at work. All the way back to the manna, there was a natural and a spiritual law. Remember when the manna first fell? Uh, they didn't know what it was. They said, what is this? And they said, ma, na. Well, in Hebrew, ma means what? And na means like, please, or hey, hey, what is this? So they named it manna. The name of manna means what is it? I don't know. It just fell from heaven. And it says something that neither you nor your forefathers ever knew. You didn't know it. It was something new. So there's, there, you see what I'm talking about here. There is both a supernatural, there, there's a natural and a supernatural element to what we consume, to what we eat. So we take this into the spiritual realm. Remember that Jesus said to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, he said, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So if we feed our natural man, we also then are going to feed our spiritual man, Right? And as we're going to feed the natural man the things that we should feed the, this body, which is the temple of the Holy Spirit, in the same way as it is the temple of the Holy Spirit, we need to feed our spirit in the same way, uh, spiritually speaking. So, um, John 4.34, uh, Yeshua has just ministered to the Samaritan woman at the well. And the disciples come up and they offer him food and Jesus said no. He said, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. What does that sound like? It's food that you don't know about. What is this? I don't know what this is. Jesus said, my food is to do the will of the one who sent me and to accomplish his work. That is what sustains me spiritually. 
Just like this natural food sustains you physically, what sustains me spiritually is to do the will of my Father and to finish the work that He sent me to do. That is my spiritual food. That's what keeps me going. In John 6.32, so in John uh, 4, John 6, and then later on, John, later in the chapter in John, Jesus kind of, He keeps talking about the same thing. In John chapter 32 and 35, uh, they had come up and said, Look, Moses gave us manna in the wilderness as a sign. What sign do you give us? And Jesus said, it wasn't Moses that gave you the manna in the wilderness. It was my father, basically, is what he's saying. He said, but I am the bread who came down from heaven. I'm the living bread. In other words, Jesus was, it was like Jesus was the manna. That rock that followed them, that gave them water, it says, and that rock was Christ, right? So Jesus was sustaining them in the wilderness as the second person of the Godhead, the second person of the Trinity. But he said, It isn't Moses who's given you the bread from heaven, for the bread of God is the one. The bread of God is the person coming down from heaven and giving life to the world. And he says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And then later on in verses 47 and 57, Jesus makes that distinction even between the manna and his salvation when he says, look, your fathers ate the manna in the desert, yet they died. But I am the living bread that came down from heaven, and if anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. Now, Jesus says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part with me. And they left. They said, yeah, we can't can't take that. That's that's a hard saying. We can't deal with that. He turns to the disciples and says, do you want to go too? And they said, what? Yeah, where else are we going to go? You alone have the words of eternal life. The words of eternal life. He said, your fathers ate the man. He said, but I'm the living bread. And if anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. Now, next Monday, the 22nd is Passover. And uh, you guys had, did y'all had a Passover cedar last year, I think, didn't you? Or the year before? You do one every year? Okay. So, yeah, next Monday is Passover. And, and it was at that cedar, that, that Passover cedar, that service that Jesus entered in covenants with his disciples as they partook together. And if we look at in, in Luke, he gives, the, um, he gives the clearest um, recounting um, of that story. So Luke chapter 22. Says, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will never eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And when he had taken a cup, he offered the bracha, the blessing. And he said, take this and share it among yourselves. For I tell you that I will never drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. And when he had taken the matzah, the unleavened bread, and offered the bracha, the blessing, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in memory of me. In the same way, he took the cup after the meal, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you. So he's, he's kind of here, he's, he's uh, <clears throat> bringing all of this to a conclusion. And he's been saying, you know, my, my, uh, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. But here at this Passover cedar, he's basically, basically saying, I am the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And you have, this is, he's, he's talking covenant here. And that's what communion is. When we take communion, it is the cup of covenant. And he, he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. And so every time we're taking communion, we're renewing that covenant with him. And the bread, his body, we go back to Isaiah 53. He was wounded for our transgressions. He bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. And so here at, at this Passover, Jesus is giving them finally the bread and the cup. And he says, I'm not going to do this again until I drink this cup in my Father's kingdom. You know, at, at uh, Shabbat, every Friday night at our house, um, we all, when we break the bread, we thank God for it. And we say, Father, we thank you for this bread and everything that it reminds us of. Everything is symbolic. of. We thank you, Father, uh, for your word, which is the bread of life. 
We thank you, Jesus, uh, for the, being the bread of heaven who came down for us, whose body was broken. We thank you for the word of God, the Holy Spirit speaking into our life. We thank you for the rhema words that you speak personally into our lives. We thank you for this bread and all it represents. And we say also, and we thank you, Jesus, because you said the day will come when we will sit down at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and break bread with them. I'm looking forward to that, I want to tell you. And so I pray that every Friday night. Jesus, you said the Gentiles will come from the nations. We'll sit down at the table and break bread with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I'm looking forward to that. And he said, I'm going to drink this cup new with you in, in, in my kingdom. And so when we drink the cup on Shabbat or on Passover at communion, we remember when Jesus said, I will drink this cup new with, me in my, with you in my kingdom. And we say, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. We long for the time for you to come when we will sit down together and you will lift that cup for the first time since this Passover and you will say, here we are in the kingdom of God. The bracha, the blessing. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth uh, the fruit of the vine. And so I'm going to close with this. I, I just believe that we need to feed on the word of God. I believe too much of the gospel, and I appreciate Calvary Chapel. I appreciate their method. <clears throat> There's not many people that can go through your church for seven years and somebody read something out of the Bible and you say, well, I never heard that. Because you're going to go through, the, you go through it every seven years. Does your church do that? Through the whole Bible every seven years? Pretty much, yeah. So you're going you're gonna to get all of this. You know, but a lot of churches don't get that. And they get, they get a, a diet of the Word of God, pretty much like our American diet. And I believe that that diet many times is... Uh, Overly processed, diluted, made palatable, it's malnourished, lacking in whatever it needs, and, and not the full, you know, Paul said, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you might grow thereby. In another place, he said, by now you ought to also be eating meat. And so I, I think that, uh, I don't think, I know that the church is by and large, largely biblically illiterate. I mean, it's just so many people who know so little about the Bible. I was teaching a session, and there was a couple that had been in church, I know, all, their whole life, I've known them their whole life. I was teaching on something, and they came up to me after and said, I have never heard that before. And I, I don't remember what the expression on my face was, but I'm thinking, why? Why have you never heard that before? You know, if you're going to feed on the Word of God, if you're going to read the Word of God, I'll just tell you, folks, I rarely ever leave the house without reading the Word of God in the morning. I will not leave the house unless I've read the Bible. I will not leave the house unless I prayed first. I feed. I mean, I'm going to give myself breakfast every day. I'm going to feed on the Word of God as well every day. We need to be feeding on the Word of God. But I want to tell you about a man named Jim Watson as I close. Jim's a volunteer at Harvest. Been there for 10 years, almost since I came. Jim was retired. Didn't know what to do with himself. Um, one of the pa local pastors said, Jim, you, you ought to go spend some time volunteering at Harvest. He came down there. He's been there ever since. Volunteers almost every day. When Jim came to Harvest, he didn't know the Lord never owned a Bible. He'd never read a Bible. But he started listening. He got hungry. He accepted the Lord. Jim's read the Bible through over four or five times in the 10 years he's been. I mean, read it all the way through, started over, read it all the way through again. And he's just hungry for the Word. And we'll be talking about stuff. And, and it, sometimes I'll, <clears throat> I'll forget someone say, Jim, Jim, where's that found? He goes, well, it's found here. Because just in his hunger for the Word, he has fed incessantly on the Word of God for these past few years. And it shows. It shows with the wisdom that he has and with the, <clears throat> with the word of God. And y'all can pray for Jim, and I'd like to close tonight. We can, we can, I've got more to say, but I don't have more time. So um, I would like to close in prayer, but i also like to ask you to join me in prayer for Jim. He has stage four cancer. He's at home now. First time he hasn't been at harvest um, in 10 years. So uh, only because he has to stay home. So would you join me in prayer for Jim Watson as we close uh, tonight? Father, we love you, God, so much, and we thank you, Father, for your word, which is the bread of life. We thank you, Yeshua, Jesus, that you are the bread who came down from heaven, whose body was broken and bruised to give us life, and whose blood was shed so that we could have remission, forgiveness of sins. And we thank you, Father, for your word, Lord, which is the bread of life. For man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Father, I pray that you would give this congregation an insatiable appetite for your word. I pray, Father God, that they will not let a day pass without feeding their body, but they will not let a day pass without feeding their spirit on the Word of God. 
I pray, Father, for a hunger for your word, Lord. Jesus, you said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. And Lord Jesus, we know that your righteousness is found in your word. So, Father, I pray for a hunger for your word. I pray for a thirsting for the presence of your Holy Spirit. I pray for your blessings, Lord, upon this congregation, on Pastor Jim. Lord, I pray you'll give him refreshing during this time of vacation. Father, I pray for Harvest Ministries, your blessing in that ministry. And we lift Jim Watson up to you, God. Father, your touch on his life. You're the God of miracles. Father, we just pray your Holy Spirit would be his companion during this time. God, comfort him, give him peace. Lord, we pray that his, day, his life will not be cut short one day, Father, or one moment earlier than what you have designated for him, Father. Lord, bless us tonight. In the name of Yeshua, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. Thank you so much for allowing me to share with you tonight. If you're able, let's, let's stand as we end in worship.
Father, we give you honor, glory, and praise tonight because you are God and you are worthy. Father, as we go into this week, Lord, we pray, Father, help us to be salt and help us to be light. Help us to be bold in sharing the truth of your word, Lord. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. 